So after introducing the basics of instruction set architectures, let's go to the next part of our lecture on microprocessors, which is calling a procedure. So there are six stages in calling a function or a procedure. These are the same thing. First, we're going to place the arguments where the function can access them. So we're going to save our arguments. Then we're going to acquire storage and save registers that are needed. So certain registers will need to save them in order to replenish them after, use, after running the procedure. Third, we're going to save the return address and jump to the function. So remember, we need to save um, the place that we are going to continue running after finishing the procedure. And then we're going to change our PC to um, include the at to have store the address of the function itself. Then, of course, we can perform the desired task. And once we finish, we need to return to the function. So a return is going to be placing the result values where the calling function can access them, restore any saved registers, release any local storage resources, and return control to the point of return. The procedures use the stack to store the registers, variables, and etc. So let's go into what the stack is. The stack is a piece of memory that allows us to nest procedure calls. Okay, so the stack contains one stack frame, or it can also be called an activation record, for each active procedure. So we have our main procedure over here, our main. Okay, and our main is going to call a procedure F1, and it's going to pass some argument X, Y, Z. So what we have here is a stack frame that um, is going to be the frame that belongs to function F1 itself. And so we call this whole thing a stack frame. It's a piece of memory that goes from a low address to a high address. It can also go the other way. It depends on the, uh, the ISA and the implementation itself. But we're going to just look at it from growing from bottom to top. What the stack frame includes are, of course, the return address that we had to store. It can also be stored in different places other than inside the frame. It can be stored, for example, inside a register. But for uh, this discussion, we're going to just show everything stored inside the, um, the stack. It's going to store saved registers. These are these types of registers that may be overwritten by the uh, F1 function, and then main may want to use them afterwards because it has to return to the same state it was. So the saved registers are also going to be stored inside the stack. Arguments. So some of the arguments we're going to be able to pass through um, registers, but other ones we're going to want to store them on the stack to provide a larger space other than the limited number of registers we have. And um, different types of variables that we're going to use inside, inside our F1 function, they're going to be stored in, in um, and changed and so forth and accessed on the stack. So this is the private memory, you could say, of the F1 function. We have something called the stack pointer, which um, if you noticed in the ABI before, it is actually one of the basic processor registers is going to include the stack pointer. And that is a pointer or a, an address that points to the top of the stack. So that's the, the end um, address of the stack from uh, to which we're going to push new data and then we'll grow the stack or pop data and remove something and then um, reduce the stack. And we have the frame pointer which shows us where the base of the stack is, where we have to kind of return to once our, um, our function is finished and we want to reclaim all that memory that we used. So a function call has what we call a prolog that comes at the beginning of the function. And what the prolog does, it move, moves the, st the stack pointer and the frame pointer up by the frame size of the next frame. It will then store you know, all the things, the, the current return address, the saved registers, um, and so forth. It will save on the stack. And so we have a new frame over here for the F2 function that um, we passed over some arguments inside. And um, it's going to be all stored inside the stack. Some of it can be stored on uh, registers, but let's, for just discussion's sake, as I said, we're going to show it stored on the stack. We, ran, we then run F2. And we may use uh, the, this frame to store all kinds of variables and so forth. And now we finished, and we're going to return from um, F2. And so we want to kind of reclaim all of this, uh, this and replenish you know, the saved registers and so forth. So what the epilogue is going to do, it's going to restore the saved registers and, um, and the return address and so forth so we can then use them and return back to the state that we were inside F1. And then we're going to move back the stack pointer down and the frame pointer down, which basically releases the memory that was over here. We're not going to do anything that's going to erase the actual memory that was in there. But by the, by the fact that we just moved the stack pointer down, that doesn't exist anymore. 
And then we're, of course, going to change the program counter to the return address, actually the return address plus, you know, uh, incremented by one. And then we're going to uh, be able to continue running our, um, our function. So let's discuss what we call a calling convention. Um, the, uh, we have, first of all, a caller. That's the procedure that uh, makes the call. In uh, the previous case, it was main calling F1 or F1 calling F2. That's the caller. And then there's a subroutine, which is the callee. That was um, F1 when main called it, the callee was F1. Or F2 when F1 called it, then F2 was the callee. So that's the caller and the callee. We need to ensure that the caller's state is not changed during the subroutine. Because remember, when, once we finish running this function, we have to come back to the function that called it, right, the caller, and we have to be in the exact same state we were when we ran the function. So we, we have to save uh, important data. And so the caller can save important registers before um, calling the routine. So the caller is going to save some important stuff. The, on the other hand, the callee doesn't want to ruin what the caller does. So it can see that if it's going to overwrite some of the state, which is basically the registers of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, CPU registers, it can save them and then restore them when it finishes. However, that means that who actually does this? If both of them store, you know, uh, store the registers, then we're going to have some redundant stores, redundant saves. So the calling convention is a definition, it's usually part of the ABI, which will define which registers will be saved by the caller and which ones will be saved by the callee. And when we know which ones will be saved by each, we know that we're not going to have any redundant stores. The compiler or the programmer should really adhere to the calling convention and know who's going to save them and then all of the functions will be written in that way and we ensure that we're going to return to the right state without any redundant stores. So later on, we're going to go over the calling convention of the RISC-V ISA, and we're going to see exactly how the calling convention in the RISC-V ABI is implemented.